Well, it is my great honor to welcome up to the platform here, Ronnie Musselwhite. And he comes to us again from out in Dighton, Kansas. We were just trying to figure out how far that is. We're thinking 250 miles or so. Ronnie, it's a blessing to have you with us. Ronnie is with the Gideons. And I'm just going to turn this over to Ronnie and let him speak as long as he needs. And tell us a little bit, Ronnie, why you're here, what's going on this weekend, and just whatever the Lord puts on your heart. Can you introduce me to Dr. Jesus? This was a question asked of a pastor in India. The young man had posed the question, lived in a village where influenza had hit and hit hard. His father had contracted the infection and was losing sight in both eyes. The Gideons had recently distributed a New Testament at the young man's school. And he began to read his. And he became fascinated with the story recorded in Mark chapter 10, where Jesus healed blind Bartimaeus. He took his testament to the nearby pastor and requested to be introduced to Dr. Jesus. The pastor ministered to the young man and prayed with him that God might heal his father's eyes. And that uh, the family might eyes be open to spiritual visions. God answered that prayer. The father's eyes were healed. The family accepted Jesus as their savior. The young man went on to college and is now a pastor in India. You see, one life was changed. And many lives are being changed through this man's ministry, all because of a benevolent contribution and the power of God's word. The prophet Isaiah speaks of the power of God's word. In chapter 55, verse 11, we read, When the word of God goes forth, it will not return void, but will accomplish that which pleases God. Oh, and I believe that. Like all Gideons, I believe that the Bible is the inspired, the infallible, and inherent word of God. Isaiah continues in chapter 40, verse 8. The grass withereth, the flower fadeth, but the word of God shall stand forever. The Gideons are an international organization of born-again Christian men and professional men and their wives. Since 1899, our purpose has been sharing the gospel with the world. Today, we are in, organized in over 200 countries. We publish scriptures in over 100 languages and dialect. The demand for the word of God exceeds our supply and resources. We place Bibles in the designated traffic lanes of life, places like hotels, hospitals, convalescent homes. We distribute New Testaments to students in schools and colleges and to prisoners, to police, fire, and medical personnel, as well as men and women in the armed service. The Gideon's number one need is for prayer. Pray for open doors locally and around the world and for a steady flow of resources in which to purchase the scriptures. At the close of this service, you will have the opportunity to help purchase scriptures. If God has placed it in your heart, please, please consider a financial gift. It is with the help of Christian friends in many different churches that we are able to place scriptures locally and around the world. Now, in my hometown of Dighton, it is located in west-central Kansas at the intersection of Highway 23 and Highway 96. And, and right at that intersection is a convenience store, which is a popular gathering place for us locals, as well as travelers traveling those highways. I want you to keep that in mind for a minute or two. About 15 years ago, I had the opportunity to engage in a Bible distribution 
at a small school in West Central Kansas. We'll turn the clock up to about 10 years ago. I was sitting in that convenience store in the back booth drinking coffee with friends. A pickup pulled up out front and the young man got out and he walked into the convenience store and he surveyed the, the store. And he saw me sitting back there in the booth and he approaches me and he says, Mr. Musselwhite, Mr. Musselwhite, do you remember that Bible you gave me when I was in high school? I said, yes, I do. I said, I believe it was a New Testament with a red cover. Yes, yes, he says, I still have it. It's in the pickup. You want me to go get it? I said, no, that's not necessary. All I want to know is, are you reading it? Oh, yes. And he said, my wife and I were active in our church. Wow. Do you remember what Isaiah said? When you and I share in the, in the Word of God, when we share that, it will serve the purpose for which it was intended. About 18 months ago, once again I was at the quick shop. <laughs> this time I was fueling up. And uh, a vehicle pulled in next to me. And one of our local merchants got out and he began to approach me and said, Ron, Ron, I just experienced the worst moment of my entire life. The worst moment of my entire life. He said, I found myself sitting in this waiting room all by myself. Over on the table in the corner was a Gideon Bible. He said, I picked it up. And I began to read selected passages. And he said, had it not been for that Gideon Bible, I would have never made it through the morning. He reached into his coat pocket and he said, Ron, I want to make a contribution. He said, you Gideons, please keep place of those Bibles. Keep place of those Bibles. Wow. We can only do that with help from friends like you and many, many other churches. So if the Lord convicts you or leads you, please consider a contribution this morning. Pastor, I thank you for the opportunity to share a Gideon report and to be a small part of your worship service. Thank you very much. Thank you for Amen. The Gideons have a, a, a really special place in my heart also as my uncle Andy, who some of you knew. He was the person who ran the Bible Supply Station. I like that, Bible Supply Station, down at 10th in Kansas for many, many years. And closed down about 83, moved down the street, was called Christian Book and Gift Store, 1020 South Kansas, like so many other things that just sort of disappeared over a period of time. But he was very involved in the Gideons. And I'll tell you, that's a legacy that is very close to me. And I thank you guys for that. Whenever I would go to a hotel, I would look in the drawer first thing to see if there was a Gideon Bible. I, I know that it's becoming increasingly hard for you guys to do this in some places. So pray that this work will continue. But you know what? God's going to get his message out one way or the other. But what you do is so vital because we never know who's going to be the recipient of that word. We're throwing the seeds out and, and it's going to catch some of that ground. You know, Jesus talked about four types of soil. There was a well-worn path and the seed would come on there and it wouldn't take root and the birds would come and eat it and fly off. So that seed didn't work. Then we had the seeds that were of the rocky soil. Very shallow, and that seed would work, it would sprout up overnight, and it would be gone just as quick. And then we had the third type of soil, and that was the, the soil of all of the weeds and all of the other things that were just vying for the nutrients, and it was choking off that seed so that it didn't really produce anything. And then we had the good soil, and that good soil is where that seed took root and it produced all this fruit. We never know what type of soil we're going to throw that seed on. Am I right, Brother Ron? But when we throw it out there, God's going to take care of that. He's going to get that person. Just like you were saying, the person that needed to hear it, he's going to get that person. And they're going to be there at the right time, at the right place. And we never know. If these people had not come up to you this side of heaven, you would not have known that. But isn't that wonderful when they come up and say things? I can just picture you out there. If I ever go to Dighton, I'm going to call you for a cup of coffee at that quick shop. <laughs> 
Amen. Well, again, thank you. You guys, in your bulletins, there should be uh, some uh, envelopes. Every little bit helps, right, Ron? Every little bit helps. And again, we thank you for your contributions. If you put it in the basket back there, um, who should they make the check out to in a situation like that? Gideon's International, and then we will somehow get that to you or Bill, uh, one way or the other. We'll get that if you can get it here today, and, and you can even pick it up here before you go. Okay. If something comes in later, uh, I'll get a hold of Bill. Uh, Bill Maudsley was here back a few months ago, so Bill's a great guy. Well, it's, like I said, this was a power pack service today. We've got a lot to do. Um, Again, what a blessing. I feel like the service is, is just really taken off. That was a great presentation. Seriously, it was awesome. Um, let's look at our sermon scripture for today. And it's found in the book of Philippians. One of my very favorite books of all the Bible. It's a book of encouragement. If you feel down in the dumps and you just feel like, I just can't keep going, read Philippians out of all the books in the Bible. That's a short book. I think it's five chapters. You read that book. I'll tell you what, if it doesn't lift your spirits, come see me, please. That is a great book. It'll take you 20... 25, 30 minutes to read it. So let's read chapter 2 and verses 5 to 11. You must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. And though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. And when he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God. And he died a criminal's death on a cross. Therefore, God elevated him to the place of highest honor and gave him the name that is above all other names. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue declare that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen. What a, what a great uh, portion of scripture. The title of the sermon today is called The Same Mind. Some Bible versions say that we are to have the same mind that Christ had. Others, as I was reading from the New Living Translation, it says you should have the same attitude that Christ has. And it's tough order, isn't it? Because we are so caught up in the world. We are so in the world that it becomes almost, I won't say over our heads, but it becomes very difficult to just focus on the Lord. If it was every day was like this, when we came into church on Sunday and we were just in this little room that, that we felt the presence of God, that we were away from the world out there, we could just breathe. And I think that's what is so important about coming to church. We get that chance just to breathe, just to exhale. We feel almost protected from all of the stuff that's going on. And yet we're called to go back out. We're not called to stay in this room, are we? We're called to be in the world, but not of the world. There was a book that was written in 2007. It was called Attitude is Everything. Change your attitude, change your life. It was a book by an author named Jeff Keller. Now, if you've ever been out to Barnes & Noble bookstore, just walked around... You will see no shortage of books that would be considered self-help volumes. We will teach you how to recognize this great potential that lies somewhere deep inside you that's untapped. But all you got to do is, is discover this and you will be a wonderful person. You'll have all this satisfaction and all this fulfillment. Book after book, shelf after shelf full of these books. And I would think to some level, there are some good things in those books, quite honestly. A lot of it, I think, comes right out of the Bible, to be quite frank with you. A lot of the teachings in some of those books refer right back to the Bible. I like that this book that Jeff Keller wrote has what he calls 12 lessons, each of which is designed to get us on the right track and make us a success in this life. Let me share about eight or nine titles of these lessons or these chapters. Number one, your attitude is your window to the world. I'll buy that. I think there's a lot of truth there. Number two, you're a human magnet. I much prefer that than you're a human maggot. Number three, picture your way to success. 
Number four, make a commitment and you'll move mountains. Well, we know how we move mountains. We pray and we believe. Jesus said, if you, if you believe and you can tell that mountain to move and it will, you know. So again, a lot of these are right out of the Bible. Number five, turn your problems into opportunities. I like that. Number six, stop complaining. That's when I'm just going to skip over. <laughs> I'm kidding. Number uh, seven, associate with positive people. Oh, there's a good one. It's hard to be around positive people when everybody around you is negative. You ever, you ever dealt with that? Yeah, it's tough. We have to make the choice. Number eight, confront your fears and grow. And then the last one I'm going to read here is get out there and fail. Not get out there and succeed, but get out there and fail. Get out there and try something. Don't just sit back and go, ah, what's the use? Our neighboring movement talked about there is no such thing as failure. But, you know, back to what you were saying, Ronnie, I don't even look at that. I give the results to God. You know, if he's telling me to do something, I'm just going to go out and do it to the best of my ability with the Holy Spirit leading me, hopefully. That's my prayer. I don't want to run in front of them. I don't want to lag too far behind. But I believe that he will... Do things that we don't even know about. That he will take care of the answers. And he will take care of the of those results. That's not my job. My job is to be faithful and to be obedient. And let God take care of the rest. So a few years after he wrote this book. Jeff Keller had this comment. Now listen to this. He says, my definition of success changes all the time. Right now, I would define success as having two components. The first component is to have the courage and the discipline to develop your own unique talents. Every person comes to this earth with certain talents. When we develop and use our talents, we feel fulfilled and we serve others who can benefit from our gifts. Why do we use our gifts? So we can benefit other people. Not so we can make ourselves look all high and mighty and get all kinds of accolades. Those are all going to fade away. My Uncle Andy, to quote again, he used to say, Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ is going to last. The second component, he says, of success is to be growing in love and to develop a deeper connection with God. I found that to be fascinating because here is someone that was talking about self-help. But ultimately, the self-help that we're going to find is when we submit to God and we grow in Him. When we love God and we love people. That is the greatest commandment. Do you remember the person that came up to Jesus and he said, Good teacher, what's the greatest commandment? And Jesus said, Well, you should love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your strength, with all your soul, with all your mind. And the second one is like unto that, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And this person said, well, that sounds good. And, you know, go out there and do it, Jesus said. Don't just talk about it. Go out and do it. So for some people, it's a long-term realization. We work ourselves. We keep busy. There's, there's people that are called workaholics. I would just call them busy folks. They are always doing something because they're trying to Avoid dealing with that gnawing feeling deep inside them that something is missing. They realize, though, when they're quiet, when they settle down, that there's more to life than just going through the motions, punching a time clock, or spending their days watching the world go by on TV or on Facebook or on YouTube, whatever it might be that their social media is for that particular day. If you've ever had that thought that something's missing, that there's an emptiness I would say you're in good company because, folks, we are put here on this earth to do more than just make a buck or to be what the world would call a success. Do a few good deeds, make ourselves feel like we're really doing something for the Lord even. Eventually, we've got to take a look in the mirror and be honest with ourselves and realize that until we give God access to our hearts and our lives, things are just going to be a little bit out of sync. When you look in the mirror, and when I look in the mirror, it's something dawned on me this week, you are looking at the most powerful person in the world. That's you. It's not the President of the United States or Russia or China. It's, it's you. Because only you 
have the capability of determining your eternal destination. Amen. You have to decide, are you going to receive Christ or are you going to reject Christ? And, and you can't have it both ways. Jesus said, either you're for me or you're against me. I think we have to take a look at that ourselves sometimes. Where are we, Lord? Are we, are we following you? Are we walking with you, Lord? We see this power that we've been given, and it's a little bit sobering. It reminds us that we have to make some choices. We have to make some decisions. Palm Sunday today is that day where we remember what Jesus did. We are talking about attitudes and how Jesus had this attitude that took him all the way through a very difficult week. He goes into Jerusalem on the back of that donkey and the people are shouting Hosanna. Praise to the King of David. The Messiah is here. And Jesus is looking at him. He's just... I think, in a sense, he's just shaking his head because he knows that a lot of those cries in about four days are going to turn over to crucify him. So on the Palm Sunday story we're reading today, everybody's throwing the palm branches down, laying their cloaks on the ground, and Jesus is recognizing really what's in front of him, which is a date with destiny. His destiny is the cross. Jesus was not a victim. He willingly went to the cross. Jesus wasn't some person who couldn't have saved himself, but he did it for one reason and one reason only, because he loved us. All the people in the world that were there was there because of uh, uh, Passover. Uh, now, at that time, Passover was the uh, time where the Jews came from different corners of, of, the, of the world at that time. To remember what what happened back in Egypt. Remember when God came and set the people free from the Egyptian slavery. And and you guys know this story as well as I do. That there were nine plagues that uh, God sent to Pharaoh. Um, Moses is there telling Pharaoh, let my people go. And they won't let him go. Finally, what happens on that tenth one? The angel of death comes and... The people who had that blood of the lamb over their doorposts, they were saved. They were spared. The ones that didn't lost their firstborn. And this is exactly what they were celebrating when Jesus rode into Jerusalem. Little did they know that Jesus was going to be that lamb of God that they had talked about so many hundreds of years before. It was pointing to Jesus, the Messiah, this lamb of God who had come to take away the sins of the world. His blood was going to go on that wooden doorpost, the cross of Calvary. And through that shedding of blood, he saved you and he saved me. If we just receive it, that's our choice. So Jesus goes into this situation and I look at his attitude. What was Jesus's attitude when he went into Jerusalem? I believe it was one of one word. We could just sum it up. It was one of love. He, he loved the people. Whether they were formed today and against them the next, he knew what was in front of him. But he came to die for each and every one of those people. He loved them so much that he went all the way to the cross. And he didn't just stop when it got inconvenient or when it got difficult. And he knew that there was going to be a, a price to pay. Jesus' love isn't just some type of a fluffy puppy dog type of love. It was an extravagant love. It was a radical love. It was a very costly love because he came to save us from our sins. In so doing, he didn't just take his body and put it on the cross, but he took all of the sins of the world upon himself. And that was the most costly part for Jesus. He who knew no sin, he became sin for us so that we could become the righteousness of God. That's what Jesus did. He gave us his righteousness as he took away our sins. So Jesus didn't come as some type of a self-improvement guru. He came so that you and I could be set free. We were at the rescue mission on Thursday night. And it was one of those things, again, where it would have been easy to stay home. I'm not patting myself on the back. I'm just saying it was it was a little late for me to be out. 730 may not sound late to you, but it is kind of late for me. And I had my wife join me. I was so glad she came. And then a gentleman named Gerald Henry, he came and played the guitar. And you know what was interesting was I, I go there 
um, almost every month and do a service. And there's different people. I ran into an old friend from junior high school who was there. And at the end of that service, we invited people to give their lives to Christ and also to come up for prayer. And you won't believe that people just lined up for prayer. There are a lot of hurting people in our world today. People who on the surface may act like they got it all together, but they're really hurting inside. I was at work, I think it was on Wednesday, and I listened to the police scanner pretty carefully. And so I heard a call come in. And you hear these calls almost every day, either a suicide attempt or a successful suicide. You'd be shocked at how many people take their own lives right here in Topeka. It's literally shocking. And this one was just two blocks away from our house. And they said the person was in the garage and they was found there. And sure enough, he had, he had committed suicide. People are hurting. There are scars. There are wounds that we're really good at concealing. And Jesus came today to heal us of those wounds and those scars, those hurts that all of us have. Sometimes we hide them really well, <laughs> but if we pull our sleeves up, they're there. We can all show us and show each other our scars. We don't have to go into all the dirty laundry of our life, but just to say that Christ came for that pain that we suffered. He came for the wounds that we have. Matter of fact, he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities, and upon him was laid all of the sins of the world. Jesus took it all for us. So... I want to encourage you today uh, as we think about our attitude. We have a lot to say about that attitude. And we ask God to come in and give us the attitude of Christ to love other people. We don't need to make it complicated. It all boils down to love. If we took everything else, all the great teachings of Jesus, and we just boiled it all down, you're going to have one thing left, and that's love. Love God. Love your neighbor. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this time where we remember your goodness and we remember your grace. We remember how much you loved us, that you came all the way down from your home in heaven, that you gave up your rights as God to come down and give your life for us because you loved us that much. Now, Lord, I pray you would help us to realize your great gift and help us to just receive it, Lord, just as you give it to us today, maybe in a fresh way, just help us to embrace you into our lives. Thank you for being there with us. Thank you for being there for us. We thank you in Jesus mighty name. Amen. And amen. Well, it looks like we had a little power outage there, but you know what? With the Holy Spirit, there's never a big power outage is there. We got another song that I think we can use because this is hooked up on a battery. See there, there's always good things how this works. And this will be page.